All right, guys, BLM here, back with a new video. In this video, I'll be doing a review of the latest season of Australian Survivor Champions vs. Contenders 2. So there's a lot to talk about here, so let's just jump right into it. So first, I want to talk about the theme. Obviously, Champions vs. Contenders. This is the second season in a row that they're doing this. And, I mean, I liked the theme last season. I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, obviously, I don't really understand why we had to have it a second time from a general standpoint. But obviously, you know, production-wise, they knew that this was better for branding. Obviously, it worked last time. Last time, the ratings went up. And this season, I mean, it worked even better. I mean, the ratings are the highest it's ever been for Australian Survivor. So, obviously, I get it from that standpoint. But it is kind of strange to have two back-to-back -back seasons with Champions versus Contenders. The cast, like usual for Australian Survivor, is solid, but there's a lot of duds. That, I mean, it is a 24-person cast, obviously much bigger than US Survivor. And to me, this season probably has a lot more duds than any of the previous seasons. But it also has some of the best casting choices of the entire series as well. I mean, you have David, you have Luke, you have Janine, Harry, Pia. I mean, there's a lot of good cast members here problem is you also have people like Hannah and Sam and Casey and a lot of these just really forgettable people. I mean Susie and stuff. It's like, like there's a lot of people here that are really forgettable that get almost no screen time. But something that was good about the season is that at least a lot of the bigger names did make it to the post-merge. So we did get a post-merge of all the best characters of the season. But now let's go through everything episode by episode. There are 24 episodes to be talking about here. So let's get started with the premiere and the premiere was pretty strong i mean luke was instantly back to his old tricks obviously being fantastic in the confessionals we saw an instant majority form on the champions tribe composing of all the athletes that did end up controlling this first vote where anastasia went home who by the end of the season was pretty unremarkable i didn't think she on that actual episode she seemed like a decent strategic player but just like pretty bad socially and that's really what ended up costing her and obviously, if Pia had gone home over her like it was originally supposed to be, this season completely changes. Episode 2 was alright. I mean, this is the first time we hear from David, who ends up being probably the biggest character of the entire season. We also got to see a lot of the Contenders tribe and their dynamics, which weren't too interesting. I mean, the vote essentially came down to who was the weakest, and it was between Baden and Laura. And Laura ends up going home. And she's another one where I could barely tell you anything about her except for she's short and she seemed to have a strong personality but again taken out way too early for me to actually care about her episode three is where the gameplay starts to really pick up we had luke and david find the idol and along with janine and pia they're able to flip over ross and abby and blindside the other members of the sporty seven by taking out Susie in a six to five vote and Susie, is someone that again I, I know nothing about her. I mean, she was like, what, I guess a marathon swimmer or something like that? And that's it. And again, that's that's what I'm saying about a lot of these earlier boots is that I know nothing about any of these people. But whatever, let's move on. Episode four was a weird episode where we had a lot of the episode focus on Sarah and the challenge where she's supposed to overcome her trauma from the tsunami. And she doesn't. Instead, she just stands up there and like, doesn't overcome her fears like it's really strange from a storytelling standpoint because it really felt like they were setting up for her to triumph over this trauma that she's had but instead she just buckles under pressure this episode did have janine finding the contenders idol and it did have some interesting drama with stephen bradbury and abby and we did end up having this new minority thinking that stephen was going home but the majority instead blindsided nova who i thought was a fun character on the show she was kind of your typical strong female with like a dominant personality and relatively confrontational. And that personality really just made her a massive target. But again, I thought she was good too. She's actually probably one of the better early boots. But she was just never cut out to do well on Survivor in my opinion. Episode 5 could have been a really boring episode as I had a really boring boot. But it did have the breakout moment for David where, where after Sean finds the champion's idol, he's able to get Sean to give him the idol while he gives Sean a fake idol instead. And again, this was incredible. This is fantastic TV. And really, it sets up their storylines for the rest of the season. And I do think this was obviously a good short-term move for David as obviously he gets an idol. But a terrible long-term move. Again, this was never going to work. But as I mentioned before, Steven goes home. 
It was a boring boo. I mean, I thought Stephen was good TV. I mean, there's that. I mean, he started the Sporty 7. He played really hard. He got into confrontations. He never gave up, even when he was at the bottom. I, I do think he was a pretty solid pre-merge character. Episode 6 was another episode with a pretty boring boo, but we did get some fun character moments from David. But E.T. was the boo, and E.T. was pretty boring. I mean, he seemed like a great guy, but gameplay-wise, there wasn't much there. He seemed just like a less douchey version of Andrew Savage, and pretty much played similarly to him as well. Now for episode 7, which was a pretty great episode. I mean, we did have the tribe swap here, where the contenders had a champion's majority, and the champions had a contender's majority. With Luke and David being completely on the outs there. On the Contenders Tribe, this is where we first hear about Oscar, which is uh, Harry's fake sons. That, that was great. But on the other tribe, we had Luke and David fighting to save themselves. And eventually, Daisy decides to flip alongside John and Baden to take out Sam in a pretty big blind side. I mean, there's some great reactions here. I mean, I, I literally couldn't tell you a single thing about Sam as she wasn't even on the show. She, she literally never even got a confessional. The only person in the history of English language survivor to never get a confessional. And for that title to go to a seventh boot is completely ridiculous. But yeah, I mean, there just isn't much to say about her. Episode eight was just an okay episode. I mean, this is where Harry finds his first idol. And the boot here is pretty boring, and Sarah, who is clearly like the next to go after the Sam boot, but I did think she put up quite a fight. I mean, Sarah was again a strange character for a show where she only got screen time in three episodes. And her entire storyline the entire season just revolves around this tsunami storyline, and it really leads to nothing. Like, nothing comes out of this at all. She never overcomes any fear, she never does anything with it. And again, while I did like how hard she campaigned towards the end of the game, Honestly, it was never going to work, and to me, at the end of the day, she's just not a good player. Now for episode 9, which could have been a fantastic episode, but it was a non-elimination episode. But this episode did have the return of the idol swap storyline, where Sean finally finds out that the idol he got from David was fake, causing him to tell Daisy to get rid of him. But the new contenders finally lose an immunity challenge, leading to Harry trying to draw all the votes onto himself so that he could successfully play the idol, and... This includes revealing to the tribe that his son Oscar doesn't exist. And this also starts his storyline with calling Janine the godmother. And this entire edit between Harry and Janine really remind me of the edit of Benji and Matt from last season. But instead of what could have been a really fantastic vote out here, the other tribe got to kidnap one member of the contenders. And obviously they select Sean as, I mean, he's Sean. But again, this could have been a really fun round. I mean, there were a lot of things in play here. And the twist itself was just kind of lazy and was a slight modification of a twist from season one and really just the most boring, predictable twist they could have selected. So I, was, I know that they're forced to have non-elimination episodes because of the way the Australian TV works, but I feel like they could have done a better job with this one. Episode 10 was probably the best episode of the pre-merge to me and gave us a fantastic tribal where Sean is now back with his contenders and David and Luke are back at the bottom again but they both still have their idols. And this is probably one of the most complicated tribals of the season, probably one of the most fun ones as well, where the contender's original plan is to split the vote between David and Luke, while David and Luke think that Hannah is going to be the boot. So before tribal, Andy decides to blindside Daisy using David and Luke's votes, but he also wants to flush out the idols. So he wants David and Luke to both play their idols. But we get to tribal and David and Luke are very unsure of whether or not they can trust Andy. So they change their plan at the last second and vote for Sean, who Andy doesn't want out as he had a strong relationship with Sean. And both David and Luke play their idols with Luke completely wasting his while David's votes were actually enough to save himself. It does turn out that Sean changed the split vote at the last second. And instead of voting for Luke, they end up voting for Hannah, causing a tie between Sean and Hannah, where Hannah does end up going home. Again, a fantastic travel. So many twists and turns here. I do think it would have been a better one if someone like Sean or Daisy did end up going home here, but it's still an all-time great one. But Hannah was kind of a non-factor on the show. She never even got a confessional until this boot episode here. Again, this edit is just really strange, where they're just like completely ignoring certain people, and Hannah was definitely one of those people. Episode 11 was a pretty fantastic episode of the show, which probably has my favorite non-gameplay moment of the entire season, with David at the Survivor Cinema. 
That entire scene is just so fantastic where Kevin find the idol in the popcorn machine, getting popcorn all over the floor. For some reason, no one suspects that he found anything. It's completely ridiculous. But during this episode, we finally get the tribal that we were promised during the non-elimination episode. But this time, without Sean, Casey flips on the contenders after Harry plays his idol successfully on himself, causing Casey to go home in a split vote. But Casey was pretty much a non-entity on the show again. Again, like, she got no screen time until the swap. And even then, most of her screen time came from other people just not trusting her. I mean, I did like her scrappy underdog sort of gameplay, but she was way too open about it, and really just neither side trusted her because of it. But I did think she had a strategic mind for the game, especially for someone who had actually never watched the show before going on. But again, she wasn't particularly good TV. Now for episode 12, which was branded to have a massive blind side, and instead we got the map boot, which was really obvious as he was already in the minority and would have been the recipient of a vote split. And again, that ends up happening. Harry obviously finds his second idol and he plays it successfully on himself. And the edit really tries to convince you that the champions aren't going to split the votes. But again, that's kind of contradictory to everything we've seen of the champions so far. So it became very obvious that Matt was going home. And Matt was an interesting character on the season. He didn't get many confessionals, but he was a pretty massive presence, especially in the challenges due to his really cocky attitude. And I know a lot of people were really annoyed with him, but I did find him entertaining, especially because most of the times he was really cocky. He ended up being wrong, especially towards the end of his run. But gameplay-wise, there just wasn't much there. I mean, he played a loyal game, and he was screwed by the time he went out as he was the only option left. Now we're episode 13, which was a pretty slow episode for me. I mean, the big event this episode is Ross getting medevaced, which did suck. I mean, it was a complete freak accident. I mean, the rope broke when he swung across, and hearing him scream in pain was just terrible to watch. But... I do like how they sent him off. I mean, Ross was a fantastic character. I I do feel like he was a bit under-edited, but when they did show him, he brought a lot of humor to the show, and I do think he was playing pretty well. I mean, he was well-positioned in the majority coming into the merge, and he did have a really strong social game. So it was really disappointing to see him get medevaced. Now for episode 14, where we finally have the merge, and this was a good episode, but also a pretty disappointing one. I did like what they did with the merge feast here, where instead of having a feast, they had a reward challenge with temptations throughout. And the winner was Daisy, who ended up getting all of the temptations. Now, I didn't love that they just handed her an idol. That's something I don't particularly care for, but I I guess whatever. What I was disappointed in, though, was the results of the tribal here, where I was expecting a six-on-six battle, champion versus contender. And while I did expect the contenders to lose... I didn't expect them to just give up their numbers by voting out Andy unanimously. And we could have gotten a game-changing move here if the contenders had stuck together and Daisy played her idol on Andy. Again, it didn't happen. Instead, she wasted her idol and completely screwed most of the contenders over because of it. Now, talking about Andy, I I liked him on the show. I mean, he kind of felt like a parody of a game bot where he kept on talking about playing the most dominant game in Survivor history, even though he had already been on the outs and had already tried to make a lot of moves that didn't end up working out. So obviously he was a pretty mediocre player, but he was a pretty fun one to watch for me. Now for episode 15, where we do get a pretty predictable boot in Sean, but I did think that the episode did a really good job despite of that. We do see Janine deciding to target David, and this obviously leads to the next episode, but... I really love the immunity challenge where we saw David and Sean, who are rivals the entire season in a showdown at the end, with the person losing more than likely being the boot here. And when David wins immunity, we go straight to tribal, and they do allow him to talk around some fires, which was a great visual thing, even though it was just kind of weird. And to be honest, I would have rather them just went straight to tribal, and then we get a really crazy tribal, like the Edge of Extinction one where Julia went home. But Sean goes out here with... Most of his allies turning on him as well, which I thought was a shame. I I actually really like Sean in this season. I think he was probably the best player on the Contenders Tribe and seemed to have complete control of that group in the pre-merge. But then at the merge, again, he was the voice of reason. I mean, he was essentially telling Daisy to use her idol on Andy, but couldn't get her to do it. And once he became down in numbers, he was just too big of a threat, both physically and strategically. So obviously he had to go here, but... I would like to see him play again, 
spoiler, it's not going to happen soon, but I, I do think he was a big factor on this season, someone that would have been a worthy all-star. Now for episode 16, which was a good episode, I mean, it felt very similar to the Henry boot from season two, but this entire episode essentially just being David's downfall, and it was fun to watch. I mean, the reward challenge where he loses to Abby, his confessionals afterwards were great, and I guess this is where Pia starts to shine gameplay-wise, where she gets full credit from the edit for the move, despite it's pretty clear that she doesn't deserve full credit for the move, but either way... David was a pretty strong strategic player this season, and him and Luke were able to flip the tribe dynamics multiple times during the season, which is something you gotta give him credit for, but I do think he got a bit too cocky. Again, he got blindsided with an idol in his pocket, and was too open about how much he was leading the charge, making him a massive threat. But he is an all-time great character and has some of my favorite moments in all of Australian Survivor. Episode 17 had the potential to be a fantastic episode, but Daisy is... She's Daisy. So the numbers are now 5-4 to four with champions having the numbers. So Daisy is able to find another idol. But she does it right in front of Luca Pia. So she goes into tribal saying, Oh, I'm going to play my idol for anyone. And this could have been a big game-changing moment for the season. But for some reason, she plays the idol on herself. <laughs> in a situation where the opposition knows you have an idol, like, it really makes no sense. Like, it makes... Oh, it's so dumb that she played on herself. It really is. Especially considering how... The champions have been playing throughout the entire season where they've been playing very cautiously. She should have known that they were going to either put the votes on John or Baden. But again, she doesn't. John goes home, who was a decent character. I mean, he was a decent presence on the season. He didn't get many confessionals, but he was a fun enough character, even though he had pretty much zero gameplay. Episode 18 was a bit of a slower episode where the champions solidly had the numbers now and with no idol in play, it was pretty clear that one of the contenders was going home. And while they tried to set up this storyline with Luke distrusting Pia because of a lie Daisy made, it was pretty clear that was never going to work. And Daisy does end up going home. But this episode was not elimination. They're going to Exile Island. Again, using the twist from last season. And I don't particularly like that this is being used post-merge. I, I think it's a much better twist earlier in the game. For this to happen at the final eight is kind of dumb, but whatever. Episode 19 was a bit better. I mean, while we didn't get an actual elimination, we did get a somewhat exciting vote-off where the champions finally broke apart. And this time, Luke and Abby flip against Janine and target Simon. And while the Simon boot was pretty well telegraphed, it was fun to see the different reactions to his vote out from Janine and Baden and Luke and Abby. It was, it was a fun moment. Episode 20 was kind of boring. I mean, we did get the duel between Daisy and Simon, and Simon ends up winning, eliminating Daisy, which was pretty surprising. I, I did not actually expect that. As I felt, obviously, Daisy's... A and it was much, much stronger than Simon's. But then we just get the repeat of the last round where Simon gets voted out because Janine and Pia can't get the numbers anyway. So it's boring. So let's talk about Daisy, who was a fine character this season, but what made her a bit more interesting to me was the amount of bad gameplay decisions she made and how she completely wasted both her idols. But it was still disappointing that she was eliminated over Simon, who was really boring this season and brought very little to the table. A lot of people compare him to Commando Steve, but for me, at least Commando Steve had like really unintentionally funny moments. Simon literally had nothing. And to be fair, I do think probably Simon is a better player than Steve. I do think Simon showed more strategic ability, but again, he did have a complete lack of survivor knowledge and that really showed. And again, he was just kind of boring. So yeah. Episode 21 was more of the same. I mean, we just continued this kind of boring streak where Janine goes home. But I do think there was some intrigue here over who Luke and Abby were going to side with as they could have also flipped and taken out Baden. But it's like, again, it's it's Baden. Why are you going to take out Baden? I mean, like, I thought, like, if it was the possibility of Harry or Janine, it would have made more sense to me. But they, like, instead were some reason were targeting Baden. It's like... Okay, no, that's not going to happen. Stop. So yeah, Janine goes home. I really like Janine. I thought she was one of the better characters of the season. I thought she was probably the most dominant player of the season. And while I didn't agree with all of her strategic decisions throughout the season, I, I do think she had a strong game and she was a really strong player. And I would like to see her again. But spoiler alert, supposedly she turned down all stars. So, oh well. 
out for episode 22, which was probably one of the better episodes of the post-merge, and definitely one of the best tribals of the season, and probably one that would have made the cut on my tribal council list if I made it now, but in this episode, we have Luke and Pia, who are the pretty clear next targets here, but Luke is able to find an advantage here that allows him to send someone at tribal back to camp, making them immune but also unable to vote. So after Luke wins immunity, he plays it on Baden, which I did find a bit strange as I, I actually thought he was just going to use it on Pia. It's like, why use it on Baden, making it so that there's still a chance that Pia goes home? Where if you use it on Pia, that means that Baden, Harry, and Abby have the fight between each other, more than likely leading to Abby going home anyway, which is what he wanted. But I do think he was able to pull off the move he needed to here. So obviously it does work out. So what ends up happening here is, again, Luke plays this very well. I think Luke, this is probably Luke's best move of the season, where he made it clear to Abby that he was voting with Pia, forcing Abby to vote for Harry. But he did end up leaving Harry in the dark. So Harry still continued to vote for Pia, allowing Luke and Pia to vote out Abby in a two to one to one vote which was a really fun vote, really fun spectacle for the jury. And Abby was a really big player this season. I mean, she didn't really stand out to me that much as a character, especially in the post-merge where she her edit starts to go a bit downhill. But she did make some really big moves. I mean, she flipped against the Sporty 7. She blindsided Simon twice. And eventually, she did get rid of one of her closest alliance members in Janine. So she was a pretty big factor on this season. And... Maybe we'll see her again. The penultimate episode, episode 23, was probably the slowest episode of the season to me. I, I know a lot of people love this episode. I really just didn't care for it. I mean, I really don't like episodes that are edited this way where it's very clear who is going home and they spend the entire episode making you feel bad for that player, which is essentially what happened to Luke here. And it's similar to like the Stephanie Johnson boot from a Survivor Ghost Island, which is an episode I hated as well. But this episode was even more dragged out, where they literally spent, what, like 35, 40 minutes doing this? Because once Luke loses immunity, I mean, you know he's going home. And obviously it sucks to see Luke be so demoralized. As again, he is a really fun character, and he just seems like a great human being. And obviously he is a fantastic character. He's a very solid player. I do think he's a bit overrated by the online community as a player, but he is still a really good one. He's able to use his social capital to gather numbers and pull off really big moves when he needs to. But I just don't think he's good enough to really not be perceived as a threat. And while I obviously love Luke, I do think his first appearance will be more memorable for me, at least for Luke as a character. I do think Luke as a player this season might stand out a little bit more, as I do think this season really solidifies him as Probably one of the best Australian Survivor players, but again, not one without its faults. But while he was a big character this season, there were many points where he does take the back seat to David, and even someone like Harry. But again, he is fantastic TV, and he is a really likable presence on TV. Now for the finale, which was fine, I guess. I mean, I really don't love the way the Australian Survivor does their finales. I don't love a family visit at the final challenge. I personally actually hate family visits on Survivor. And to have it be part of the finale is just such a waste of time. I mean, the final challenge looked pretty brutal. And uh, for them to last almost seven hours is ridiculous. But Baden ends up winning and eventually he is picking who he loses against. I mean, that's essentially how this goes. And he does end up voting out Harry which is probably the better move for him as they were looking for the same votes and Harry just played a better game than him in every aspect. So I do think there's more of an argument for him to win against Pia, but obviously that didn't really turn out. But let's talk about Harry. I mean, Harry was a fun character on this season. From lying about having a son, uh, his multiple idol plays, to his scrappy gameplay. I mean, he is definitely one of the biggest characters of the season and also probably one of the better players of the season. But when analyzing his game, I don't feel like he had a particularly strong winning game. I mean, he was saved by idols twice. He wasn't in the majority until the final seven. And while he does play well from that point on, he couldn't even convince Baden to take him to the end and gets completely outplayed there by Pia. So it's like he is a good player, but he definitely has a lot of faults. But now let's get the final tribal, which was pretty fun, where we had Baden furiously defending his game and Pia just knocking him down at every opportunity. I was really surprised at how aggressive Pia was, as she was relatively quiet for most of the season, but here she just really comes out swinging. So we get to the reading of the votes, and they return to the season one format of reading the votes at final tribal, obviously because the next season is being 
filmed right now. But I never liked this. I mean, I, I hated it in the first season. I hate it now. I just feel like it's a very anticlimactic ending to the season. And what makes it even worse is that, again, we get another family visit. Why do we get the family coming out during the finale? It's so strange. It's terrible. Why are we doing this? And it's really awkward, too, when they're reading the votes and... The two families are standing next to each other and, like, holding their loved one and everything. And also, it's just really awkward for Baden, too, where, like, he's with his family and he gets zero votes. Because, obviously, Pia ends up winning unanimously here, which I wasn't really expecting. I did think Baden would have gotten the votes of, like, Daisy and maybe John, but... Again, obviously that wasn't the case, but then again, I, I, it was pretty clear, obviously, that Pia was winning. So let's talk about the final two. I mean, Baden was a pretty notable character during the early game, but his edit just completely dies off to the point where when he wins final immunity, you instantly know he's just picking the winner. And he does have your typical, like, sort of Cochrane-esque story, but he never seemed to actively do much. I mean, I couldn't tell you a single game move that he made on his own. That being said, I mean, he was in the know for a good chunk of the game with the only time he was truly on the outs was during the John boot, but he did lack agency for most of the game, so I'm not surprised to see him lose. Now for the winner, Pia, who I think is probably the best winner in Australian Survivor history. I haven't really analyzed it too much, but I do think it probably is the case. I do think she's probably better than Jericho. I think she played Australian Survivor nearly perfectly. I mean... Again, Australian Survivor is very, very different from U.S. Survivor. And I might do a video on this in the future where I talk about it. But with Australian Survivor being a longer game, it is much smarter to be the second in command to a dominant player, which she was to Janine. And while she was on the outs for a couple rounds where Simon and Janine go out, and while I do knock off a good amount of points for her needing to be saved by an advantage at the final five, I do think she plays those last couple rounds particularly well. I mean, the problem I have with Pia, though, is her edit. And it became very obvious that she was winning just off of the premiere. And her edit continued to be consistently strong afterwards. Her getting strong content that didn't seem to even be necessary. And then her getting all the credit for the David blind side, which was really strange. So again, it was super obvious that she was winning. And again, while she did have some flaws in her game, I do think she's probably the best Australian Survivor winner we've had so far. Though, I mean, at the end of the day, if we're comparing her to the rest of the Survivor winners, probably lands somewhere in the middle tier. So overall, Australian Survivor Champions vs. Contenders 2 was a good season, but I do feel like the Survivor community is a bit overhyping it. I mean, I have the same issues I have with this season that I do with the rest of Australian Survivor. I mean, completely lopsided editing, the overuse of music, the repetitiveness of confessionals, and on and on. I mean, I, I again, I will probably do a video in the future where I talk about the differences between the two shows, and I'll talk about a lot of this stuff then, but I just have a lot of issues with the way the show is presented. That being said, though, most of the big characters this season did make it far, and we did have a pretty game-savvy cast that made a good chunk of big moves, but for me, I, I don't feel like this season will stand the test of time, and that's kind of how I felt about season two as well, where I adored season two when it initially aired, but as the time's gone on and as I've rewatched the season, I still like it, obviously, but it has gone from, like, near the top of my season rankings to towards the bottom of the top tier. And I think that's probably where this season will end up ranking as well. So that's the video. That's my review of Australian Survivor Champions vs. Contenders 2. And I will be doing a cast assessment for Island of the Idols. That will be coming out pretty soon. And with the announcement of Australian Survivor All-Stars, which I obviously I've known about for a while, but now it's officially announced, I will be doing a cast assessment for that as well. So expect that in the future. It probably won't be out for another at least week and a half to two weeks, but it'll be out at some point. So that's the video. That's everything I got to say about this season of Australian Survivor. Thank you for watching.